Do you believe in God? What? What? Question two. Do you believe in God? What is this? Screw you! What are you? Please answer yes or no. What kind of God would do this to people? Please answer yes or no. No. Okay. No! Don't let me go! Let me go! God damn it! Let me out of here! I need a doctor! What does it do? Just hit it. Come on! Please! For Christ's sake! Hi, welcome to To the 90s and Beyond. My name is Vince Leo. I'm the author of the film review website, Quipster.net. You can find all of my written work at that website, Quipster.net, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. While you're there, I do encourage you to check out the link to my other podcast that covers films of the 1980s, sometimes before. It's called Around the World in 80s Movies, and you can find the link to that at my website, Quipster.net. Today, I'm going to be getting into the third of a four-part look at the Cube films. Cube started in the 1990s with 1997's Cube. Last episode, we talked about Cube 2, Hypercube, and and today we're going to talk about the prequel to Cube that came out in 2004, the third of the Cube films to come out, primarily by some of the same people that did uh, Cube 2. Cube Zero is an R-rated film. It does have language, some violence, and brief nudity. The runtime is an hour and 34 minutes. The cast includes Zachary Bennett, Eric Hubbard, Stephanie Moore, Martin Roach, Michael Riley, Mike Nargang, Nug is also his name, Terry Hawks, and Richard McMillan. The director and the screenwriter of Cube Zero is Ernie Barbarash. Now, Cube Zero, this being the third in the Cube franchise, instead of going to a sequel to Cube 2, actually opts to be a prequel of sorts, to 1997's Cube. The writer, the director, the producer I just mentioned, Ernie Barbarash, got the idea to do Cube Zero while he was performing this overhaul of the script for Cube 2, which he was also the producer on. Lionsgate, who had the rights to make these Cube films, they were pleased with Barbarash's ideas and they agreed to his request to let him direct it. His first effort as a director working with a budget of about $1.2 million Canadian. So Barbarash fleshed out all of his ideas that he had pitched into a script, although one in which, when he was done, he began to doubt whether it was actually good enough, not only for himself, but for the Cube fans. They probably weren't going to enjoy it as it was because the script provided many answers to what happens in Cube, but because Cube was beloved because it produced challenging philosophical and moral questions to ponder beyond it. This, while clever, fans of Cube were probably going to hate it because, as a prequel, it explained too much of what happens, and it lacked requisite suspense, and he would hate it as well. As with the prior entries, Cube Zero, he felt, should always strive for ambiguity and explain less than it reveals. Barbara Ash felt that one of the most intriguing ideas from Cube was the notion that the characters in the story were being controlled by some sort of unseen force that no longer had a, a central power behind it. And that fed indirectly into humanity's philosophical musing of a god who no longer cares about his creation. Barbara Ash felt that he had missed that angle in Cube 2. He looked back on that film as a missed opportunity. He felt that in this Cube film, it was a must to hammer that theme much more forcefully. Given that he was disappointed with Cube 2, he felt that the rushed nature of that production resulted in a a half-baked effort that didn't really provide fans enough of what they wanted in a continuation. This revision, he wanted to emulate Vincenzo Natale, who created the original Cube, by adding more of that political and philosophical underpinning that would raise as many questions as it answers. And even the answers that it would give you would have you questioning them as well. It would also have 
human characters who become cruel to each other rather than just becoming victims to this mechanical environment where they don't even know what's going on. Barbara met with Vincenzo Natali actually over lunch a few months before he started production, and Natali was eager to learn what Barbara had in mind for this prequel to his own film, and he remarked that he thought he was headed in the right direction conceptually, although he didn't really offer any advice other than that. After Barbara completed the revision of his script, the biggest question was how they were going to pay for all that he wanted to get into Cube Zero. Lionsgate and other production partners did approve of Barbara next script, and they were especially impressed with how well it fit neatly as a prequel to the two other films while also giving viewers many more aspects that weren't previously showcased in those films. It got viewers out of the Cube structure, yet it also continued the feeling of that level of oppression and claustrophobia that is part and parcel of the Cube films. This time, though, we don't just follow what's going on in the Cube realm. We also look into this control room where there are two men who are monitoring the activities of the captives on their screens. The Cube's inhabitants are ostensibly those who've signed some sort of consent form, we learn, perhaps forged while these captives were under some sort of sedation. Their memories before they're placed into the cube are mostly erased, although there are traces that still exist at times. We also discover that this organization that is running this cube thing is rounding up those people that they feel threatened by politically, or maybe their employees or contractors within the organization who pry beyond their limited station and begin undermining the mission actively, whatever that mission is. Because they know enough about the cube structure and how things operate, these employees get lobotomized before they're placed into the cube environment. These captives are being monitored through this elaborate series of hidden cameras and through highly sophisticated monitoring devices. The foot soldiers that round up the people, they have implants in their brains that keep them compliant whenever the company calls for it. We come to learn that some of the inhabitants of the cube are criminals who have been condemned to death who decided to forego their execution in exchange for trying to survive in this cube experiment, thinking that there must be some form of escape, not knowing that it's actually rigged. The corporation has zero intention of actually letting anybody survive, despite the semblance of a sporting chance. There are mathematical clues throughout that reveal elements that become key to finding the portal that leads outside, and a presumptive do-or-die question after escaping into this room of light It's very akin to Kazan's escape in the original Cube. And that leads to another deadly challenge where there's this question posed as to whether they believe in God. And it remains ambiguous throughout as to whether a yes answer results in being spared because because people feel that any such place that would allow such a torturous Cube, there must not be a God to allow this to continue to happen. Barbara did bring in that religious element into this film, and it was not because he personally was religious or because he wanted the film to be specifically about religion, but it was something that he had always been fascinated with, with how totalitarian authority uses religion to wield power over their subjects. There are a lot of abhorrent things that are done in the name of God by these totalitarian governments completely averse to the underlying tenets that they claim to espouse to. Authorities hijack the religion, and then they hide behind it as an excuse for atrocities, much in the same way that the subordinates justify their participation in these atrocities as just following orders. Unlike the sterile cube environs of Cube 2, Barbara gives Cube 0 a decidedly grungy, retro-futuristic look, Barbara says that the look of Cube Zero was inspired specifically by some of his favorite retro-futuristic films, citing specifically The City of Lost Children, Brazil, Delicatessen, and Dark City. Fans of the first Cube really enjoyed the gritty style and some of the gory effects there, and Barbara wanted to give those fans more of what he knew that they already enjoyed, so he decided to work very closely with cinematographer Francois Dagenet, and they decided to go for a more low-tech sci-fi look for the sequel. And the cube was going to be patterned kind of like a diving bell. It would have a lot of steel construction to it. Barbara specifically wanted that because he wanted the feel of being in a submarine, very enclosed and claustrophobic, or maybe some sort of bank vault. This time out, the portals between the cube rooms are also round rather than square, kind of also giving that submarine or 
bank vault vibe to it. The main idea here was to give more solidity to the enclosure and less light, suggesting further that you're trapped and there's really nowhere you can go if something were to happen. The limited light space within each cube now adds ambiance to the entire story, and probably more importantly, and the reason why they did it this way, is that it was actually a, a big time saver because it allowed for different colored rooms without the laborious need to constantly change translucent gel panels. The colors could be added digitally later. To differentiate it from the other cubes that were done in the other movies, there's also an idea introduced here that the cube is some sort of prototype and that there has been more than one cube constructed. So even though it's a sequel to the first cube, this cube is not the same cube that we see in Cube or Cube 2. Cube Zero also raises the bar, or is that maybe lowering the bar, regarding some of the bloody kills that we see from the traps in this film. The sickest death in Natalie's Cube happens in the first sequence of that film. That's exactly what Barbara Ash dishes up here in this prequel as well. Now, very much like the first film, some of the traps had to go by the wayside. They really couldn't be made. They were out of time or they were out of money. The traps that they had in mind was one where you would see somebody get quartered and in another room it was going to fill with water. But there were a lot of logistics to that that they weren't anticipating that proved that trying to do these things were too pricey to execute. A. Scott Hamilton of Gut FX, Gut FX standing for Grand United Theories Motion Picture Special Effects, Hamilton came in having been previously an expert working in a mortuary. He did a lot of forensics as well. His expertise in graphic bloodiness came especially in handy here in his new career, creating trauma and forensics corpses for the cinema. Barbrash would later use Hamilton's know-how for questions regarding death, what happens to the human body during death, and different forms of trauma in projects that were beyond Cube Zero. As with Cube 2, the visual effects here were handled by Toronto-based company Mr. X, with Aaron Weintraub serving as the visual effects supervisor. Mr. X also took a co-producer credit this time out. In exchange for some of the monetary fees, they took a co-producer credit, which generally means that they would get a profit percentage. Cube Zero continues referencing the first film, not only in the style of the traps, but also the means by which characters use their boots as a way to set up potential traps before physically entering new rooms. Barbara Ash toyed with using other options to try to set off the traps besides boots, but in the end, he felt that naturally this would be the best choice, maybe one of the only choices that characters would have, so emulating the first film was just a matter of logic. People would probably use their boots in order to set off the traps, and it would also add a, a spark of comic relief in the way that those boots get really mangled in certain tense moments. Rather than prime numbers here, Barbara Ash had labels for the coordinates for each moving cube room using three-letter combinations. Unlike what Natalie tried to do with cube, there really wasn't a concerted effort by Barbara Ash for these coordinates to be mathematically sound. There wasn't a lot of thought involved. And instead, Barbara Ash wrote the three-letter combinations using the initials of people, including his family members and his friends and other people in the business and production companies. Sometimes there were in-jokes to amuse Barbara Ash, or maybe they were used to express an overarching irony, such as the use of SOS or CIA. Barbara Ash's rationale in not trying to make it mathematically sound, per se, was that Cube's fans, they enjoyed the puzzle-like nature of Cube, but they weren't really busy trying to decode the mystery along with the characters, and he didn't want that. He wanted people to stay involved and not get too caught up in the mathematics. The shoot for Cube Zero took place over a short 22 days. By the way, Andrew Miller, who plays Kazan in the original Cube, he was offered a role to play in Cube Zero. Unfortunately, he was very busy. Uh, they couldn't get the timing right. He reluctantly turned it down. If you see Cube Zero, you might presume that the character called Wynn in this film might have been Kazan in an earlier draft. And given the way that this film ends... You could see the parallels of those characters, even though Barbara says that they are intentionally very different characters, even though it calls back to the original film in key ways, including some of the dialogue in the very end scene. Sarah Polly was rumored to be sought for Cassandra Raines, the lead actress in this film. Polly's brother, John Buchan, was the casting director, so it made sense, but that didn't really quite work out. Barbara Ash, even though this was his first effort, uh, was very well liked by all of the actors 
They felt that his background in theater allowed him to relate very much to the actors and how he talked to them as the director. A five-foot diameter hose was put into the cube room, pumping cool air to keep the actors comfortable at all times. And along more pleasant lines, Stephanie Moore got married during the shoot. So it was generally a very jovial shoot, even though it was not necessarily easy to be in the cube for most of your day. Michael Riley, probably the scene stealer of the film, he delivers the most cartoonish villain character. He plays Jax, kind of the corporate guy who's in charge of creation of the, the very elaborate and sadistic traps. Riley really had very little time to rehearse about four hours before he came in. He came up with this specific kind of over-the-top caricature after he listened to Barbara Ash describe what kind of person that Jax is and how he fit into the overall system. Barbara Ash wanted uh, Jax to have a false eye and a limp to imply that because he was the person who created the traps, in the process he probably had a few accidents along the way in the way that he set them. Riley came up additionally with the idea that Jax should use a cane, which Barbara Ash said they, he should run with because that would make Jax additionally seem like a Mephistopheles type, like a satanic magician specifically. Riley specifically for his performance tried to channel Al Pacino's characters, specifically in The Devil's Advocate as well as other films of that era. Barbara Ash and Riley theorized that Jax would be responsible for coming up with the traps and the cat and mouse game within the cubes, and he took a specific delight in seeing people go outside the line so he had an excuse to set off those traps. Barbara Ash felt that specifically it was important to put an evil face on what was happening in the cube, but also to recognize Jax as, as also an underling to an even higher power that still lurks in the shadow. So even though we see Jax as the face of evil, we know that there's a greater evil out there that we don't see, and that keeps the tone much more ominous as to what else might be out there. And while Jack seems like the ringleader, we find out he's also submitting to this higher authority and the higher up you are, the more you have an inkling as to what the cube system is all about, but we never really see anybody who's at the top of the pyramid to know what everything is about, if such a person even still exists running the show. Barbrash grew up in Ukraine, but during a specific time when it was still under the domain of the Soviet Union, so he had a lot of philosophical musings that he had developed over that time about how authoritarian societies, especially corrupt ones, they cascade that corruption from the top down. People at the top lord over their underlings directly below them, and each one kicks down similarly. And so it becomes very oppressive, especially when you get to the very bottom. And he wondered how those minions that are in this corrupt system could be manipulated into sending innocent people into the gas chambers like during the Holocaust. How far people are willing to go so long as they perceive they're absolved of their actions because they don't know exactly what's going on and they feel that somehow they're doing something important as part of this overall whole that they have no knowledge really of. Mark Sanders, who edited both Cube sequels for Lionsgate, started out as a film composer and he had a great deal of input as to how the score by his frequent collaborator Norm Orenstein should sound. Orenstein decided here specifically on a very hybrid score. He would incorporate more conventional orchestrations that blended more with the tonal composition that he did with Cube 2. Orenstein's score evokes at times deliberately Terry Gilliam's 12 Monkeys, and Barbara sees Cube Zero really as an homage to that film as well as Terry Gilliam's Brazil and many of his other films. So it was all specifically in that keeping. Now, because Mark Sanders was splitting time with another movie he was working on, this was his first time co-editing the film, but he was friends with the co-editor, Mitch Lackey. He'd worked with him for years. They split up the editing duties so that each of them were working on different parts of the film and they could speed up the process by working on it simultaneously. Now, Although it's not particularly impactful, Cube Zero did receive an award at 2004's Screamfest Horror Film Festival, as well as the New York City Horror Film Festival. Barbara Ash says that after Cube Zero, that he was going to take a hiatus on the series. He suggested that Lionsgate could find somebody else to bring new ideas if they chose to continue it. Now, he had some ideas for continuation, and perhaps he could implement them after he spent more time on the other projects. Now, as for how I feel about Cube Zero, well... I was not very high on Cube 2. I will say it's a step in the right direction from Cube 2, so I enjoy it more. And while I do enjoy the look and the production values are higher than Natalie's Cube, 
I don't know that it really enhances my experience of watching the original Cube. It's almost like I prefer to see it as its own entity. You know, the performances here are fine. It does come up with some nifty ideas, but I don't feel that it's on the original Cube's level in terms of doing something really unique and interesting and ultimately very thought provoking over the years. You know, it's a respectable effort, but I, it's not one I would highly recommend to most people. I would say that if you are a huge Cube fan, you might possibly give it a try if you want to see it as kind of a, a fan fiction idea based on Cube in terms of trying to explain to some extent what it's all about. But I do think that it does fall short as a film I could recommend to most people. And that's why I can only give Cube Zero two and a half stars out of four. Two and a half stars on my scale means that it had all of the tools and talent to be something more. I think that the production values are there. You had a good ensemble cast. I think Barbara Ash is actually a very talented director here for a first time effort. The editing and the music are strong. And yet somehow it's just and yet it's missing that transcendent quality, that philosophical quality, even though there's an intention here to put those things in this film and it does have them, somehow Natalie's Cube sticks with you in a way that this one does not. And maybe it's because you get a peek behind the curtains, so to speak, a lot more. And so the philosophy is much more limited to the things that we know, even though there are still a lot of things we don't know. So two and a half stars is the best I can give this ambitious and respectable effort to do something with the Cube franchise that somehow still tends to fall short. If you have your own thoughts about Cube Zero, if you've seen it and you want to let me know what you think about Cube Zero, you can write to me. You can find my contact information at my website. That's at quipster.net, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. As far as what I'm going to be covering on the next episode, well, we've covered a sequel. We've covered a prequel. Let's go to a remake of a sort. It actually was remade not by Barbara Ash for Lionsgate. It actually was remade just recently in 2021 in Japan. Basically a remake of Natalie's Cube. And what's more than that, this was the first Cube effort outside of the original Cube where Vincenzo Natali had some say into how it plays out. He was a creative consultant for the remake in Japan. So check out Cube from 2021, which I'll be discussing in detail on the next episode. Until then, thank you everyone for listening and joining me as we continue our journey to the 90s and beyond.